All right, this is Mehdi and Angelina. Today, we're excited to introduce a Gentic text-to-SQL. So you've probably heard of text-to-SQL, where you can use natural language to query your database without writing or running your SQL code. But today, we're taking one step further. We're combining the power of text-to-SQL with AI agents to tackle a very simple but also practical use case that anyone working with Excel sheets would appreciate. So we will guide you step-by-step uh, as AI agents interact with your Excel data, turn it into a lightweight database, write and execute SQL queries, and, and provide answers all in one workflow, right? So stay with us till the end. Let's dive in. All right. So today's use case is a text to SQL agent where can answer questions about CSV files. This is something that I personally actually use a lot. All of us are dealing with CSV files or CSV data. Fully. Yeah. And a very common use case is, let's say I have a, an Excel sheet or I have you know, some kind of CSV file and that I need to maybe analyze or just get some insight from. And oftentimes what I have to do is to either look manually at the data <laughs> and then look for the information that I'm looking for. Or maybe I use tools like Excel or Google Sheets tools to essentially get what I get what I want. And I was thinking, what if we kind of use LLMs to be able to get that job done for us? So instead of me just doing that job manually, I can simply ask the question and then some kind of agent or AI converts that into SQL, uh, run it against the CSV file and get back the results for me. So this is for use cases where we uh, have one CSV file. Obviously it works when you are dealing with uh, multiple files as well, but the solution will be a little bit more complex. So you need to have a couple of more steps that I will talk about later. So this is the architecture that I created. If you think about it, this is essentially uh, an agent mm -hmm. because we have a set of tools, for example, to search through cache or to generate a SQL query or, or run SQL query. So these are some of the actions or tools that agent needs to, to execute and run. What does the search cache do? I, I will explain them one by one later. So this is the diagram. And if you look at it, we have two main steps. The, the upper part is the data processing pipeline where mm -hmm. it reads the CSV file and then essentially uh, creates a database schema. And then it will create a table using the CSV file, the column names and the types and all that. And then it will populate that table with the CSV data mm -hmm. uh, inside the database. And in this case, I'm using SQLite, which is very fast, very efficient, and you can even use it for um, storing terabytes of data. So it's quite capable. So we don't need any specific you know, third-party um, databases and things like that. So this is the data ingestion pipeline. Um, we read the CSV file and we run these four steps on it. Um, load the CSV, create a database schema, create a table, mm -hmm. and then populate it and store it in the database. Then after that, and this is the step that is usually done offline, meaning that it's a one-time thing, right? You do it first, and then after that, the user is start asking questions about the CSV. Right. Here, if the user asks a question, we pass the user query into our app, and the first step is we can have a cache where it stores all the user previously asked user questions, and the queries and also the, the responses in there. So first we check cache to see if someone else has asked the same question or not. If that's the case, we don't need to go and generate the SQL query and execute that. We, get, we can simply just get the response from the cache and return it to the user. But if the cache is empty or that particular question doesn't exist in the cache, then the next step would be to call our LLM and with the prompt. We also pass the user query to that. And then it will generate a SQL query based on the user natural language text. Mm -hmm. When we have the SQL query, we will go ahead and execute that uh, against the database that we have. And then we get the response, which is a, a list of rows. Mm -hmm. And then we just simply pass the, that response or the rows to the user. We also store it in the cache for future. So if the user asks the same question later on. Mm -hmm. So this is the basic architecture of this um, agent. Question. Is the cache semantic? The cache is a semantic cache, yes. It's a very basic semantic cache that I'll explain later. Okay. We had a video about semantic caching. So if uh, you're interested in learning more about semantic caching, check our video um, link here. 
All right. Um, as I mentioned, the data ingestion pipeline, four steps, pretty straightforward. Um, so this code, this entire cell essentially uh, shows all of these four steps. So I created this function CSV to SQLite. What I'm doing is I'm reading the CSV file into a data frame. Then I will connect to uh, the database, I'll pass the database name. And then um, I have another function which is going to create the table uh, from the data frame. So it's going to just go over each column in the data frame and depending on the type and the name, then it will create the tables for us. So here we are defining the table uh, schema and then we will execute create table from data frame is where we actually populate the, the table with the CSV data. And then after that, we commit, we close the connection and we are done. So what I have here as parameters, I have the CSV file, just mm -hmm. I called it movies.csv. And by the way, this is a CSV file that I found it online mm -hmm. from the web. So this is the link to the GitHub. So it originally was called Hollywood movies. Mm -hmm. It has a 970 rows about movies, so the names, the studio who actually has sponsored the movie, the Rotten Tomatoes scores, the story genre, a bunch of information about each movie. Then I called the database movies db, mm -hmm. dot db, and then the table name, I called it movies. So these are essentially like hard coded. You already defined them at the beginning. All right. Yeah. That's then when I execute this, it will essentially just create the schema and populate the table with the data. Mm -hmm. Questions? No, I just think this is easy enough. You just need three parameters pretty much. Right. Pat yes. Wrong. And then you. These are the parameters that you anyway need to define at the beginning. Right. Like the table name and the you know, database name and all that. Right. I have another function which, um, which accepts a couple of parameters, the database name in this case and the query, and then it will execute that against the database. Again, pretty straightforward. There is not really too much to, to talk about and everything is based on SQLite. All right. This is an example. If I have this SQL query. Very basic query, select you know, all the rows from that table, and then I will call that function. It will execute the SQL query, and then it just prints out the results. In this case, it shows me a, a tuple, which has 970 in there. So it means that we have uh, 970 movies in our database, not table. One more thing that I should mention, and I almost said it at the beginning, is that here we have one CSV file. So because of that, I have created one table mm. for that. Again, if you are dealing with multiple CSV files and your database is fairly complex, or you want to create a, da a, a database which includes multiple, several different tables, mm -hmm. the process is exactly the same. But later on, when you are passing the database schema, instead of passing the, in this case, I'm passing this table schema as part of the prompt. So LLM knows the structure of my table. But if you have multiple tables and only just a few of them are involved with that particular query, then what you can do instead of sending the entire database schema, you can simply just find those relevant tables for that query and only send the schemas for them as part of the prompt. Questions. That piece can be done by our agents, right? So the user doesn't have to specify like table one and table three and table five needs to be passed on to the query generation. So for that, we need to, in this case, for this code, I don't have that part, mm. but if we have, 10 different tables in our database. Right. And the user asks a question and only two of them are involved. So the way that we can find which two of tables are involved for that query, either we can just manually do that, which is what we don't want eventually. Right. But what we can do, we can have another agent, which we pass the entire schema of the, ta of the database and then also the user query. And based on that, it just says, oh, these three or two or four tables need to be used to answer that question. And then we just uh, get that information and pass it to the other LLM, which is going to generate the SQL. Yeah. If the database is extremely large, we have hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands of tables and all that, then the same rule applies. But in that case, we can even implement a search mechanism on the database schema where we actually just store the entire database schema in a vector database. So when you ask a question, it goes and just fetches, right? Searches Ooh. through that database schema. For doing that, there is a already a solution, a very fantastic solution that we created a video a few months ago. It's called Vanna, which chat with your SQL database, accurate, right? Text to SQL. 
So this is exactly for that purpose when your database is very large and complicated. Again, here I'm talking about the use cases, which is also very common. I have one uh, CSV file about, I don't know, maybe my cost or it's about whatever, but it's one CSV file, which is fairly large. And then instead of manually exploring the CSV and find answers to my questions, then I can use this agent, mm. which is doing it for me. So far, we covered the data ingestion part, which is just creating the data database and the table and populating with CSV file. Now, what the next step is when user ask a question. So here, what I have done, I have imported a bunch of libraries that I need to use specifically OpenAI and Face from Google or however you pronounce that. I think it's, it's pronounced Face is a vector database that you can essentially store and then search through them. I am using it for as a cache so for storing all the user questions. So later on, when there is a question, I can search through that and find the similar questions, right? Or the questions that are semantically very similar to my question. Yes. This is from a me uh, Meta, I saw? Yes, from Facebook. You, yeah, True. You, you said Google. <laughs> I'm picking on you, like on a very small things. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, this is from Facebook. Well, yeah. Go ahead. That's okay. Yes, I make mistakes for sure. And I am using Light LLM. Again, this is a fantastic library. I have introduced this before in our previous videos. Right. This is giving us a unified API format to call like over 100 different LLMs. Right. Uh, open AI from different providers. So that's why I am using it. Yeah. Um, besides that, there is no Langchain or Llama Index or any frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. What I have done, um, I am loading my API key and then create this open AI client object. I have set my dimension, vector embedding dimension that I'm going to use it later on. So I'm using OpenAI as the embedding model. And that's why it's 1536, but it could be different depending on what embedding models you are using. And then I here, I create the, the index, initialize it essentially. And then I have a variable, a list, empty list called cache, which is going to store all of the, the user questions. It's going to store like a triple that we will see uh, exactly the format of that. So it's a user question is the SQL query and is the response. Mm -hmm. So later on, you know, if initially it's empty, so the, when user ask a question, it will just go and generate the SQL and then it's stored it in the cache. Next time, if you or someone else ask the exact same question, then it's going to search through the cache to see if that question is already answered and exists in the cache. In that it's, if that's the case, it's going to just return the response mm. immediately. And the way that I use or define the cache, this is a very basic definition or structure from that. You can even use, instead of using a list, you can use a hash map or a hash table to even search through that easily. I have defined a helper function for embedding my text because I need to search through similar embeddings in my vector database, which is fade. I am using OpenAI again, but it doesn't matter whatever model you use for embeddings. I have defined another function, which is going to search through the cache. So I'm going to pass the embedding version of the user question and the threshold here. So because this phase by default is using a Euclidean distance, mm -hmm. meaning that if two, if two things are similar, if the distance is a small, right? That Euclidean distance. So that's why I have set the threshold to 0 0.1. So while it is searching through similar questions, if the distance between them is less than that number, then they are considered as similar. Otherwise, okay, they are dissimilar. So this is different from cosine. Got it. And here, what it does, it's going to check the index to see if that exists or not. And if that's the case, it's going to check the threshold. And if that is satisfied, then it's going to give me the index, yeah. which index in that. Then I'm using that index because this index is the way that it stores, right? All the questions that embedding is similar to the cache. So if it returns index three, then I can use that index three and go to the cache and pick that record in the cache because that's essentially the hit, right? The, and then use that one. So that's why it's there. I haven't, so here, all of these functions are essentially utility function mm. for me mm. that I need to define them to be able to uh, run the query. This one is called get table schema. Mm -hmm. I'm passing the database name and the table name. And then what it does, it's going to just extract the schema for that table from the database. So if I execute this, this is my table name and the database name I have already defined up there. If I execute this, you can see that what it does, it returns this for me. Mm -hmm. It says the schema for always is the table name. Then these are all of the properties or the columns of the table, mm -hmm. right? With their IDs. 
So this is the name of the column. This is the type and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I will pass to the prompt later on to essentially generate the SQL query. Gotcha. I have another function called generate LLM prompt, which is where I actually generate the actual uh, prompt that I'm going to pass to the LLM. Um, so here the prompt has a system prompt, which is you are an expert in writing SQL queries, and then you will be provided a database schema and a natural language question. Your job is to essentially create a SQL and then I'm going to include all the, the table schema that I have already gotten from the previous function. And so this is the, this gives me the entire prompt. Um, if I execute this, you can see that this is my prompt. Mm -hmm. So it has the fixed text here um, mm -hmm. and also it also includes the table name. And then it gives all the metadata or the properties or the schema of the table. Yeah, now it's just missing the user question. Exactly. So because this is a system message for user question, you'll see that it's basic. It just, it just says, you know, this is the question. And then I have a placeholder for, for putting the question, the actual user question in there. This function is essentially the core of the question answering part. Mm -hmm. It's called handle user question. It's going to get a user question, which is in natural language four. And then what it does, it's going first to embed the question. It's going to search through the cache to see if it is inside the cache or not. If that's the case, it's going to get the response from the cache and return it. So we're done. Otherwise, what it does, if the cache is empty, for example, or, the, or if this question is not in the cache, then it will just call this function, generate the SQL query. Mm -hmm. So it's going to pass the user question. It will get the SQL query. Then it will just run the SQL query. Mm -hmm. So inside that generate SQL query, it also gets the, or, or run SQL query here, it will get the, the LLM prompt and all that. And then it will run the SQL query against the database. And it's going to add that into the cache for future questions, for future use, right? And then it will just return the response. Here I have this generate SQL query where essentially I, I get all the table schema, generate the prompt. And this is the user prompt that you were looking for. So it's very basic. It just has no question colon and the actual question. And then here I am using, again, light LLM to call OpenAI in this case, and I'm passing the two prompts, and then it will just generate the SQL query for me. Uh, when it does, SQL query usually has some special characters, like oh, because it's in Markdown. So I just clean it a little bit. It has this back tick with this word SQL. Mm -hmm. so I need to remove them to clean that so I can execute that. All right, now it's the show time. So here, let me just clear the cache just to make sure that the cache is empty. Here. If I just run the cache, there is nothing in there. I asked this question, how many movies with action genre are in the database? Mm -hmm. So if I execute this, it says it's a miss because the cache is empty. So this question is not there. It's going to just generate the SQL query for me. That's the query here. And then it, it's a result from that. So the user will see this. And if I now print the cache in you know that this is already have some value, which is the same question and the SQL query and the response. So if I do this one, so let me comment that out and again this question is doesn't exist is not in the cache so it's going again to generate the sql query and execute that and give me the response so now the cache is twice it, it, the cache has two two items in there now if i run it again so the first time it says it cache miss but if i run it again then it says a cache hit because mm -hmm. it's already there so what it does it's going to just execute or not even execute it just simply just get the, re the response the actual value from there and then return it to me. So one, another approach could be instead of just storing the actual response, because sometimes maybe the response is very large. If you just say, what are all the movies that are made by Warner Brothers? Then maybe there are hundreds of rows. Then typically right now it is stored in the cache. You don't want to store in the cache. What you want to, what you can store technically, it depends on the implementation. You can only store the user question maybe and just the SQL query. So then you can again run the SQL query and get the response and pass it to the user. Right now, I don't do that. So we simply just store the response as well. So that's a, the entire workflow and this agent and how it works. There are, however, certain things that you can add <laughs> to this agent. And also there is a um, um, potential problem that I would like to mention and see how the audience is going to figure that out. Here is the total number of movies that are made by Warner Brothers company in 2008. But if I change this to 2007, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different query. It's not the same query. So basically 
for this one, it, it doesn't exist in the cache. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So it has to go and just generate the SQL query. However, what it does, it says it's a cache hit because um, the circle. similarity or the distance is yeah. very low, right? Right. Between the only difference here is the year is different. Right. Right, right, right. Essentially, if you, this naive approach of storing and doing the search only on based on the semantic similarity may not work mm -hmm. for queries like this. Because right now, it's, it, this is the SQL query that uh, it gets from the cache. So you can obviously see that the year is 2008. But right. here, we're looking for the 2007. Right. Um, so we need to deal with this. How do we deal with that? Right. I can think of several different approaches. One is maybe you can do a, like a filtering based on the these parameters, for example. Or another approach could be can just combine this semantic search with maybe keyword search, right? right. right? Mm -hmm. And then try to see if you can resolve this issue or not. Can, and can there we... are d different approaches for doing that. So I will leave that can... as a homework. Homework, to homework. The audience. Idea, idea. Uh, can, we, yes. can we do like a reflection agent? Like essentially you know, it, it does give you an ex example results, right? And then... You revealed the third solution, right? Essentially. Yes. What you can do is um, you can pass the user cool question, right? And which is this one. Right. And also whatever you have find in the cache right. to another LLM to judge and see if they are actually the same question or not. If right. that's the case, they are exactly the same. Right. And then you don't continue, essentially can use the cache. Otherwise, then you can go and it's a cache miss. So you right. can go and generate the SQL query and execute. That's another approach of doing, you know, dealing with that. So as I said, there are several different approaches to deal with this problem potentially. Mm -hmm. But right now this problem exists. You can see if I change this to another year, then it's not going to actually generate a new SQL um, query form. This is the entire demo and code explanation. However, I can think of several different expansion to this. Mm -hmm. One could be just to create a UI right. for that. Right. Another one, um, so you can have a conversation rather than simply just ask individual questions, mm. right? That are independent. You can even have a, a history of the conversation so you can use that's another possibility. I, I, I yes. can imagine maybe we can make it like a Excel extension and then just let Excel users to have a pop-up window on their lower right-hand side and then people can just chat with their data just there. To write a, like a Chrome extension or if you are using Google Sheets, Sheets, it yeah. could be an app inside, app extension inside the Google Sheet. That's another interesting possibility. And another possibility, another addition to this project could be right now, when we execute the SQL query, it simply returns the raw SQL response sure. to the user. Sure, sure, sure. But a better approach for some questions could be that we pass that raw rows mm. into an LLM with a question. And that LLM will generate a natural language, like a human readable response, essentially. Here, if I say total number of movies that are made in this year, instead of returning this list with a tuple, it can say, oh, the total number of movies are 21, something like that with a center. Right, right. So that could be another possibility. But overall, this is the code, more or less. You can, you can add to that. A very interesting use case. I think this is a very practical use case. Right. Can we go back and then count how many agents do we use in this whole thing? Like search, cache. So these three functions are the main agents. So we use search, cache, right? There was a search, cache. There was generate SQL query and there was run SQL query. So all of them were here, right? Mm, mm, mm. It's run SQL query. Right now, all of these functions are independent individual functions. But what you can do to... Uh, make it more look like a real agent is you can have a class in that class is like an agent class and then you can uh, define tools and the tools are nothing but essentially these functions right, that right. The, the agent has access. Right. So by looking at the code, you may not think that, oh, this is not really well, an, agent. Like an agent. So now it's like I mean, what is an agent? Agent is, a, a, is, an, is an AI software, right, or system where has access to a set of tools, right? Right. Functions to sure. execute like a multi-step task to achieve mm -hmm. a goal. Right. So that's right. the definition of an agent. And right. if you think about it, we are doing exactly the same thing, like multi-step thing to get the answer. And so you can think about one agent 
which has multiple tools, or if you want to even break down each one of those functions into a separate agent, you can have an agent for SQL query generation. You can have an agent for executing the SQL query, for example. You can have an agent for searching the cache, right. so on and so forth. Or you can have one agent but all other things are tools that this agent is using. Right, right. I find it interesting. Maybe agent is like, like an age old thing that actually has been used in software development long ago. It's just if you ingest a little bit LLM inside of it to make it smarter for each step, then it becomes AI agents, right? Yes. Agents are becoming more and more popular, uh, yet coming up with a very unified uh, definition of them is still sometimes tricky. There is not really a very a standard definition. Each person has their own True. definition of an agent, but my definition is agent is an AI system, which has a few properties. One it's it has an AI brain, which is LLM mm -hmm. usually, True. and then it has also memory, mm -hmm. which can use. It also has a set of tools, a collection of tools that it can use. Um, and then also it performs actions mm. autonomously, independently on behalf of the user. Right. So any software system with those four attributes is essentially called an agent. Right. Opinion. Okay. Yeah. And, and think of this prototype today, if you think about it, because some of our audience asked about like, if we're building a rack system from scratch and people want to not only just interact with the unstructured data, they also want to work with a structured database potentially. So this could be like one set of the paths that a RAG system can go through to deal with structured data, whereas we can have a, maybe a router or something to decide whether actually this query, this question has to go through a database versus a uh, right, versus a unstructured vector database. Yes. Yes. I can think of a, another app where you have two different routes. One is right. to interact with uh, unstructured text, like PDFs mm -hmm. and all that. And there is another route, which is, for example, uh, dealing with CSV files and text to SQL. Right. So you can ask questions and depending on your question, then you can go different routes, like right? Right. either one. If it is about the PDF, for example, it can go and do the similar things that we discussed, right? Uh, chunking the documents and you know, answering the question based on that. Or if it is about CSV file, then it can go this route. Indeed, there is a, a video about that from LLMware, if I'm not mistaken. So they have published a video, I guess, a, a few weeks ago, maybe that they are implementing exactly the same use case where mm -hmm. you know, there is an app and it does two different things. It's a RAG, regular RAG, and then it has the text to SQL mm -hmm. kind of thing on the CSV, but they are doing it and they're using, you know, LLMware, which is by the way, a very fantastic library in my opinion. Um, here we are using no frameworks, so we're implementing oh, everything. Oh, but if you use, but if you want to do LLMware, they actually have uh, some very small language models mm -hmm. they call it slim and one of them that is actually very good is and which is very small you can execute it locally or multiple many of them at the same time is a text to sql fine-tuned model which has i guess around 600 million parameters so it's very fast you can even integrate that with olama and then use it so yes Cool. Before we end the session today, we want to also mention that we have a course about building your comprehensive RAG system from scratch end to end and for production ready use cases. So we welcome you if you're interested, talk to us and join our cohort. We look forward to see you all at the class. Yes, the course is a cohort based, meaning that we will teach that there will be lectures and then office hours so they can ask questions and they will implement RAG from basic all the way to advanced RAG. And we cover a lot of topics. That's a course for whoever wants to implement RAG in their companies or for their businesses. Yeah. And you will get to be like my role here on our YouTube channel. So you get to ask questions, all kinds of questions as I do all the time with, with my friend Vinny. And you can also bring your work projects to talk with us and we'll give you some practical advice on like how to help with your day-to-day -day work as well. So exactly and i'll see you there